is wonderful to see each and every one of you here today. We're thankful for every opportunity we have to worship. Worship the God of heaven above. We're thankful that you're here today. We want to mention a few things just by way of uh, opening announcement uh, reminders. Don's mentioned all of these, but let's remind ourselves of them and pray for these before we dive into our study this morning. This is our final week for VBS on Tuesday night. And we'd love to see you here. We had our highest number of children this past Tuesday night. So week three, we had 52 teens and below. That's our highest of all three sessions though far, thus far. We'd love to see this coming Tuesday be our highest of all. So I hope that each and every one of our own will be here. And also love to see any guests we're able to bring as well. And we also look forward to having Brother Joe Manasco with us to teach our teens and our adults in here in the auditorium. Uh, Joe uh, grew up in Jasper, grew up at 6th Avenue, was Cole Wade's roommate at Freed Hardeman, and he's doing a great job at Liberty and pursuing professional school in addition to his, his biblical training already. So we're excited and thankful to have him here with us, and he'll do a great job. Be sure that you stay afterward, as we'll also um, have pizza and ice cream afterward, and that'll be a great treat for us. Sign-up sheet is in the foyer for that. We're also thankful for this coming Saturday, uh, back-to-school emphasis for home devotional, in-home in -home devotional, hopefully outside, weather permitting, uh, at uh, the home of Chris and Andy Atkins. They've put in some work and preparation for this already. We're excited to join them in their yard and play some, some yard games and spend time together. We'll have uh, some devotional thoughts, but also have other fun things to do. So be sure that you come to that, bring your lawn chair, bring finger foods, and we'll enjoy that evening together. We will have uh, maybe some, some karaoke going. So if you want to do some research and some planning and preparation for that, uh, have some fun uh, with that opportunity. And also, along the back-to-school lines, be sure that you're here on Sunday night, August the 7th. We'll pray for all of our students by name, all of our teachers by name, all of other support staff by name, as we send them back that week uh, with prayer. And so we want to be sure that we do those things, those important things that often dictate our calendars. We want to, to do those with God's um, will in mind and with God's care in mind by praying. And so our elders and deacons will lead that and we'll be blessed with our time before the throne of God. Let's pray about these things before we dive into our study. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all the ways you bless us, especially with time and opportunity uh, to grow together. We're thankful for this time to worship, but we're also thankful for additional times that strengthen us uh, in your body. We're thankful for the midweek service, the time to study, and also time to emphasize and invest in our young people, our children. And we're thankful for how Vacation Bible School does that, and we pray that you'll give us wisdom and give us excitement this coming Tuesday as we wound up this month of July. Bless our teachers. We're thankful for them. Bless our other adults and volunteers who are helping. We, we thank you for them. We thank you for all the homes that have been represented, and we pray that you'll be with them this week. Help us to be back here Tuesday at 6, and help all of us to invest in one another especially these young souls. We pray for these two back-to-school opportunities that we have, that you'll bless us as we spend time together growing at the Adkins home on Saturday night, Lord willing. And we pray that you'll give us a great fun evening, but also an evening which we can turn our hearts together toward you. And we pray for our back-to-school prayer service, that this will be an opportunity that engages one another in prayer before you and also sends us into that arena with your blessing and with opportunities to make a difference. Give us clarity and give us courage as we represent you in all things. Pray that you'll bless us now as we study the courage of King Hezekiah. Help us to focus on your word. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We're going to start quickly in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. If you want to turn there, we're going to highlight a few verses before we then go to 2 Kings chapter 18. So if you have a marker in your Bible, have a way to, to mark both of those passages. We'll start quickly in 2 Chronicles 32. And then go to the Second Kings account, Second Kings chapter 18. A man named Bert uh, Terhart, who's a Canadian, he became the first American, and by American we mean North or South American, right? He's Canadian, but he's the first person from either continent to completely circumnavigate the globe using only what they call celestial technology. So he used only a sextant and pen and paper and some log books that he carried. First person from either continent to do that, the ninth in all of world history to have been recorded doing that. And when he arrived back home after 260 something days, he left in October, he came back in late June, almost July. When he arrived back home in Western Canada, he was dubbed by some as the safest man in the world. He did something very unsafe by being solo at sea in a small 48-foot boat. 
But he was dubbed the safest man in the world. Because you see, he left in October of 2019 and returned home in June of 2020. So when he arrived, he had not been exposed whatsoever to coronavirus or COVID-19. And so they said, look how lucky you are to have been safe from COVID. He kind of took exception to the nickname, though, the safest man in the world. He said this, although at zero risk of getting coronavirus, I was in no way, shape, or form the safest man on the planet. During the time I was in the Southern Ocean, which is the majority of his trip, I was perhaps the least safe person on the planet. I just couldn't die from COVID-19. Everything else, however, was on the table. Listen to this, these two sentences especially. There is no safe. Safe is an illusion. To make his point, he just asked the rhetorical questions. How many people die in their sleep every day? How many are killed walking across the road or falling down the stairs? From a purely practical standpoint, he's right. He understood by being out in the ocean, there's no such thing, there's no such, pla no such place as a truly safe place. As the world defines safety, it's impossible to truly find a safe place. A small virus, a small germ has revealed that to us. Doesn't matter what attempts you make to separate yourself from it, it can and will find you. Sin reminds us of that. You can go to places that should be safe, but when people choose to sin, it becomes an unsafe place. And also the laws and rules by which the Lord designed this world can cause any place to become an unsafe place. A natural disaster can occur in a place that perhaps has never occurred before. It can overwhelm and destroy buildings and vehicles and cause places to become highly unsafe. But we want to learn this morning that when it comes to the spiritual protection of God and the comfort he gives as the Lord provides safety, he's always and everywhere available and accessible. So as the world defines safety, it's impossible to find a truly safe place. But as the Lord defines and promises safety and security, it's impossible to go somewhere where he is not. It's impossible to avoid and to get away from his safety as long as we're his children and faithful to him. Now the most emphatic moment of Hezekiah's life and reign as king is going to emphasize this truth. The incident we're most familiar with Hezekiah about reminds us of this truth. You can't go anywhere in the world and it truly be a safe place by its standards. But with the Lord, us being on his side, he can ensure and does ensure that any place is a safe place in his sight. So Hezekiah is a king of Judah, the southern kingdom. He's ruling what we call the early 600s B.C. So it's closer to 700 than it is 500. And he's ruling the southern kingdom, Judah. He's known for being a good king. We want to see why he's known for being a good king, but especially how he exercised his courage in a very large testing of his faith. So let's notice some things from 2 Chronicles chapter 32. The opening verses set the stage about Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, coming down against Jerusalem. But likely what he's talking about, the author of Chronicles is talking about, is how he's moving toward Jerusalem, but he's not yet attacked. He's attacking and defeating the cities leading up to Jerusalem in the area of Judah. What does Hezekiah do? You'll notice beginning of verse 2, he makes some preparations. He exercises his faithfulness to God by doing several things. By cutting off the water supply, likely, verse 30, you may kind of notice there, when looking back on his reign, he reroutes the water supply, a stream that's on the northeastern side of the city. He reroutes through a tunnel underneath the city to the southwestern side, becomes the Pool of Siloam. It's likely... When he reroutes the water supply, there in verse number 3, that's what he's doing. He's building that tunnel underneath the city so that they have water, but the enemy cannot. He rebuilds the walls where there's been gaps, reinforces the protection of the city, and then he begins to organize the military, provides them with new weapons. And this is the text that Tyler read for us, but look in the text of chapter number 32, verse 6. This is coming out of his faithfulness to God. This is not an effort to say, we're scared, we don't trust God. This is coming out of his trust in God. 
So halfway through verse 6, he gathered them together to him in the square at the gate of the city and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that's with him, for there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. So the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Mathematically, he knew the Assyrians had more than he did in the walls of that city. But he knew that math was not all that counted. He said there are more with us than with them because he knew the power of the Lord. And he knew that if he would choose and was choosing to be on the Lord's side, they had the majority and would always have the majority because of the power of the Lord. Now he's making these early preparations before Sennacherib and the Assyrians ever get close to the city. But we also need to see something important about this. These are not the first implementations that Hezekiah has chosen to do. That you go back three chapters. You go to chapter 29. All the way through 31, you see a series of improvements that Hezekiah chooses to do. First, he cleans up and he fixes, he repairs the temple, the temple structure itself. And then he brings back the worship of the temple. He consecrates the priest. He consecrates the sacrificial system. And the third thing he's now able to do, because those two things have been fixed, is he reinstates the Passover there in Jerusalem. See, they couldn't observe Passover because their priests weren't doing the right thing. Their sacrifices were all out of whack, and so they couldn't do Passover. Well, they observe Passover, they do so in Jerusalem. And then he gives further organization to the priests. And that's important, too, because it's perpetual. He understands, I can do some things as king, but there's no guarantee they'll continue on after me. And his son, Manasseh, was not a good king. He was an evil king. But if I will organize the priests, the priests have the power to perpetually keep the people close to God if they will remain faithful. So what Hezekiah is doing is all along, his faithfulness is preparing him and Judah for a crisis of faith. And this is not our purpose, the main purpose of the lesson, but it's one that's worth remembering. Sometimes, and maybe I've been guilty of doing it too, we'll talk about these good kings and we'll list a series of Hezekiah's reforms. But I noticed this week, you never find the word reform in the text of Scripture when it comes to these kings. You know what word you do find? You do find the word restore. Now look at verse number 20 of chapter 31. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. He did what was good and right and the faithful before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God, and, listen to this phrase, in accordance with the law and the commandments. That's restoration language. In accordance with the law and the commandments. Seeking his God, he did with all of his heart and he prospered. I hope we just notice the difference here. He doesn't say, let's do things better. Let's pursue excellence. Let's be the best we can be and then know that God will bless us. He says, we will seek God and what God says. We'll restore his commandments, his laws, and know that when we do those with all of our hearts, he will bless us. So we don't like to think this way all the time, but it's true. We are either going through a crisis of faith right now, or we will in the future. And Hezekiah's daily commitment to restoring the things of God is preparing him and his people for a moment when their faith is going to be tested by this outside enemy. So let's now flip over to the Second Kings account. Second Kings chapter 18. One thing that's very interesting about the Second Kings account is it's, it's isolated to chapters 18 and 19. But in the, both books, First and Second Kings, this story is only second in emphasis in terms of amount of space devoted to it. It's only second to the building of the temple by Solomon. So if you read First and Second Kings as the history of the nation of Israel and its divided kingdoms, the one story that gets the second most emphasis behind the temple building is this story between Sennacherib and Hezekiah. It comes at a crucial juncture in the history of the people, and it contains extremely valuable lessons about seeking God for the courage he gives. So we're going to notice this about Sennacherib and Assyrians especially. The enemy is bold with psychological intimidation. 
fear, even if it's a physical fear, fear at its root is always psychological. And the enemy is trying to present something that looks physical and will threaten their health. But he tries to get in their head first. He wants to manipulate and brainwash them. Now before we dive into the specific text of what he says, we need to catch ourselves up on something that's happened historically. We've said Hezekiah is the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. But this is now coming some 10 years after the northern kingdom was attacked by Syria. And it would fall at their hands some three years later. So seven to eight years after the city of Samaria falls, the northern kingdom is captured, destroyed. Now Sennacherib, the next king of Assyria, is coming down against Judah. So that's got several things going on here. They've just found out their brethren to the north have been destroyed. As a corporate nation, they are no longer. There's still Jews that are alive, Israelites that are alive, but now the nation of Israel with its home capital there in Samaria is no more. It's assumed a territory of Assyria. That's to the north. They also know that God's promised his wrath when they will leave him. So they know why Samaria was destroyed. And now they're wondering, are we next? But there's another level to this psychological intimidation going on here because you see it's a Syrian-controlled territory now above them to the north, but Sennacherib is going to come at them from the south. He's going to conquer Lachish, which is a bigger city than Jerusalem, and it's to its south. So can you feel just how it would feel to be in this pressure, stretched from both directions, from above and below? We're getting attacked, we're getting strong-armed by the enemy who's bigger than us to the north and to the south. You can see why there's preparation. You can see why there's fear that's going to happen. So what happens now when Sennacherib sends word? He's going to do so by a, um, a spokesman. His title was called a rabshakeh. Here's what he's going to begin to say, beginning in verse number 17, or really verse 19. Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? It's a powerful opening phrase. Do you think you can talk your way out of this? Do you think words are capable enough strategy for war? Now the irony is, is that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to save troops. They're trying to get them to give in and surrender without a fight, without a battle. But he's saying, you cannot trust words. You may mean your words, but you can't trust them. That doesn't mean you're going to defeat us. That doesn't mean you can resist us. But next, notice verse 21. Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Egypt was the power to the south. It was always coming back up into what we call the holy lands and taking land and losing and then taking land and losing. And so he's saying, if you're resisting us, that must mean you're on the side of Egypt. And they're just like this walking stick, this reed, and it's so weak it's going to break. And when it breaks, it's sharp. It's going to hurt you for leaning on it. You can't trust other people. You can't trust this other nation. Where's your trust? So now keep reading. Verse 22, master manipulator here. Bully, he's anticipating the response. Verse 22, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? This is fascinating what's happened. Because they're using something good that Hezekiah did against his people. See, Hezekiah came in and rooted out the, the altars of idols that they had built up in Jerusalem. There's one altar for our one God. He got rid of the rest. But he's trying to convince the people along the wall and just inside the wall, hey, your king got rid of all the altars. How are you supposed to worship God? You can't trust the Lord because he's not going to accept your worship. He continues. He's going to offer this wager and say, if you try to trust yourself militarily, remember this, we've got far more people than you do. And he says, I'll even give you a head start. I'll give you 2,000 horses. All you have to do is supply the riders. Because he knows you don't have 2,000 
trained riders to fight on them. So you can't trust yourself. Militarily, you're not prepared for an enemy such as us. Then he continues, verse number 25. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now he's really getting deep against the Lord. Who are you to say, Judah, Hezekiah, that I'm not here because of God? This is the Lord's will. We're fulfilling prophecy here. Now you see where that seven-year, ten-year occurrence of Samaria being overthrown comes to play. We know Assyria was sent to destroy them. Are they sent to destroy us? Is he right about this? Then verse 31, he says this, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me, come out to me, then each one of you will eat of his own vine, each one of you will of his own fig tree, each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern. While you remain in Jerusalem, you'll be free. I'll let you take, take your fill. I'm not going to cut you off. But then, 32, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. If you stay here with Hezekiah, you'll die. If you come with us, you'll live. Do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. You don't need Hezekiah. You don't need the Lord he's talking about because I will let you enjoy to your fullest. I'll give you everything you need. And then finally, verse 33. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Well, the gods of Hamath and Arpad, where are the gods of Sephar, Sepharvayim, Hena, and Iva? Now listen to this one. Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. He again goes back for the third time to say, you can't trust the Lord. And he uses what he would consider proof, evidence. Look at all the people I've defeated. Where were their gods? Now prove to me your God is any different. We might call these, or at least several of these, not all of these, we might call these truthful lies. Because you can't trust words, you can't trust others. We shouldn't trust ourselves. He's using them to leverage the psychological impact of saying, who are you going to trust? That was the opening question. And now he's offered this systematic undoing, attempt to brainwash and say, you cannot trust anything, anyone but me. Now, imagine you're in the city and you hear this. They speak this in Hebrew so that the people can understand it. How would you respond to such a long list of attempts to bully and to brainwash? What would you say? What do you say? How do you respond to someone who's bullying to this degree? Hezekiah had thought ahead. And he commanded the people to not say a word. And they remained silent. Oftentimes, the best response to a manipulator, to a bully, is intentional and unflinching silence. They recognize him for what he's worth, so they don't respond. But they are still afraid. So you pick up in chapter eight or chapter 19, beginning the first verse, you see Hezekiah finds out. The, the messengers along the wall come and tell Hezekiah what's happened. And Hezekiah goes to the Lord, and Hezekiah has word sent to Isaiah. So Hezekiah prays, Isaiah prays. And when Hezekiah sends this message to Isaiah, you find the clue as to how this is going to unfold and why it's going to unfold with God's blessing. He does say we're in a, we're in a tough spot. And he recognizes their own role in it. He says, we're kind of like this woman who's full term. It's about time to give birth, but we can't. That would have been, especially in their day, a, a situation of great shame. Well, here we are. We're embarrassed. We're, we're kind of hung out to dry because of our unfaithfulness. But then he says, verse number 4 of chapter 19, It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. And Isaiah comes back and says, don't be afraid of mere words. The Lord will have him rerouted back home, and he will die in his country. So that's the prophecy from Isaiah at this stage. And then what happens next? Well, you find it unfolding. 
Sennacherib hears that another foreign king is going to come attack him, so he leaves. But he's careful about his image. He doesn't want them to think that it's because he's afraid. So he sends in writing a letter that doubles down on how they cannot trust God. So this is what he puts in writing for Hezekiah. Chapter 19, verse number 10. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you. Do you hear how blasphemous that is? Don't let God deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Where are all the kings who clung to their gods when me and my fathers before me came down and attacked them? Don't you know we are the world's preeminent empire and your God or gods cannot withstand us? So we get to this point of the, the story. We need to see something important about about Sennacherib. He's modeling for us what our spiritual enemy loves to do, to intimidate us psychologically. Our enemy loves to exploit the fact that it is true that nowhere is 100% completely safe so that he can then position his devices as the only place to turn. Think of how many addictions have started, whether it's substances or behaviors like gambling or pornography. They exist because that's the only place I can turn for release from this pain. Think about how many poor relationships have begun because I'm afraid of being left out. I'm afraid of not being accepted. So I'm going to enter into this relationship because I'm afraid. There's nowhere that's safe. I need to find safe people, but really those people are unsafe. That's what Sennacherib is setting up for Hezekiah and Judah. That's what our spiritual enemy loves to do to us. He loves for us to see an ungodly choice, an unrighteous choice, a wicked choice, and for us to feel what else is there to do. I can't make any other choice but this sinful choice. See how Hezekiah could have easily thought, well, the only thing I could do is give up, give in, surrender. I've seen what happens with these guys north of the border. Maybe I should just give up. That's what Sennacherib is banking on. And that's what our spiritual enemy wants us to feel and to think. But God wants us to know something different. He's given us a spirit not of fear, but something greater. And so Paul would talk about this in Romans 8, verse 15. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You're not a mere slave, you're a son. You don't operate by fear. You can't be controlled by fear. Instead, you live out of the acceptance you get as a son. And how do you see that acceptance? You see it by a willingness to cry out to him. Cry out to him for help because you know he hears and because you know he will answer with help. That's exactly what I, Hezekiah has already done once. And now as we shift into the story to point number three, that's what he's going to do. Because God always blesses Godly responses of trust. Hezekiah is not running around with an anxiety-filled response or reaction. He's been preparing with his faithfulness. And although he couldn't have told you the details, he is now able to respond to this future crisis of faith with a response rooted in his trust in God. His prayer begins, chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse number 14. Listen to what he prays, verse 15. O oh Lord, the God of Israel... Enthroned, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. You only are God. You are the only God. Now listen closely to the next paragraph, verse 16. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire for they were not gods but the work of men's hands wood and stone therefore they were destroyed Hezekiah doesn't send his answer to Sennacherib but he answers Sennacherib's criticism in his prayer to the Lord and he says I know that guy is wrong 
He's right in that these other nations have fallen and their gods did nothing to help them. But it's because they are not true gods. Everything else these nations have run to for help have been adequate, inadequate because they are not real. You hear how genius that is? How trust-fueled that is? He's using all this evidence to try to get us to give in. But he does not know how different you are. That you are not a God, you are the God. And these other nations have fallen because they did not know you. The reason he's right is because those gods are not real. But the reason he's wrong is because you, God, are real and are the only God. So now, verse number 19. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So he cries out for rescue so that not only Judah, not only Assyria, not only Egypt, but all the nations will know God and know that he is God alone. What happens next is Isaiah, the prophet, is going to give him a message of comfort. But notice what's happened, the order of things. Sennacherib sends word to Hezekiah about the Lord. And then Hezekiah speaks to the Lord about Sennacherib. And now through Isaiah, the Lord is going to speak to Hezekiah about Sennacherib. And it's that third one that always matters the most. So Isaiah says, first to Sennacherib and about Sennacherib, because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. That last phrase may seem kind of incidental and casual, but it's, it's pretty offensive in battle because the idea is if you conquer new lands and new territories, you don't have to come back the way you came. You're going to go back the way you came because you're not going to win. Now, the phrases that precede that are highly graphic for the Assyrians because despite all they promised for a land that's as good as yours, you remember that? When they would deport people back to their homelands, they often just immediately began treating them not only as slaves, but as animals. And they would take giant hooks similar to our fish hooks, and they would just pierce them through their noses and similar bits, metal pieces in their mouths, and they would tie all of them together with everyone else. So just imagine a lion and a group of people all tied together by these metal impalements. Dozens, hundreds, thousands forced to walk together hundreds of miles. Imagine the pain when one person stumbles. The pain of going up a hill. God says, you want to know what's coming to you? You're going to be treated how you spent your decades treating other people. You're going to become my animal that I will work hard and I will beat and I will hurt because of how evil and twisted you've become. But then there is a response also to Hezekiah. This is where the hope comes. This is God's response to a godly response of courage, godly response of trust. He gives a message about their crops. We don't see a lot of this and we didn't have time to break it down. But when the Assyrians were coming in, they're going to burn the crops of the, of the Jews. They're going to cut them down. They're going to steal them. And so it's a very real problem that the Jews are wondering, how are we going to eat for very long? They're worried about what's going to happen tonight, but they're also worried about how we're going to live for three months or six months or a year. And so the message Isaiah gives to the Jews and to Hezekiah is, eat off the land for one year. Eat off the land for a second year. But then the third year, you'll be able to gather up excess and be able to survive for even longer. It's what the Lord is doing, is resolving this tension they would have had, knowing the northern kingdom had just fallen and wondering, are we about to fall too? He's saying, you will have future hope. That three years from now, you'll not only have enough to eat, you'll be able to put it aside for the future. So not only will the crops take root, but the people will take root. And the people will bear fruit upward. Because there will be a remnant of people. He's giving them present hope by pointing them to future hope. And then he answers their prayers for that night. One angel comes and destroys 185,000 Assyrians. King Sennacherib has fled to Nineveh at the rumor of this king who's going to invade. But he leaves his troop behind and 185,000 of them are killed in one night by one angel. And then Sennacherib 
conveniently never mentions any of this. His accurate records or his historical records are preserved on three different kind of columns. And on one of these, he describes this skirmish with Hezekiah. And he talks a lot about how much he gave him and how much he whined and complained and, and tried to buy him off. But as for the battle itself, this is as far as it goes. This is all he talks about in terms of the battle with Hezekiah. As far as him, I can find him inside the city of Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. Doesn't mention that he lost 185,000 men. Doesn't mention that he, he left Jerusalem to go to Nineveh to never return to Jerusalem. Think about that for a moment. He lived 20 more years after this and never came back to Judah. Why? Because he lost almost 200,000 men the last time he went. So he confirms history by being vague on purpose. He can't allow his pride to say, I lost a ton of men. He'd make a good headline writer today, I guess, just by saying, hey, I shut this guy up. But then, 20 years after the prophecy of Isaiah about how he would go back home and would die, he would be killed in his own country, not only is he killed in his own country, he goes into his own temple to worship his God, and his sons come in and assassinate him while he's worshiping. That's not coincidental. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. And God is sending a clear message to Judah and to all the world. He's not a local God. He's not just the God of Judah. He's the God of all the nations. So not only is God more powerful than Sennacherib, he's more powerful than Sennacherib's God who could not protect him in his own temple in the middle of his own worship. He's more powerful than Sennacherib's nation because he's more powerful than all the nations of the world. Remember that was Hezekiah's desire. I want all the nations to know that you are God and you are God alone. As we wind down this morning, consider how this fulfills and reflects so much of the truth of what we know in Scripture. Psalm 75. For not from the east to the west, and not from the wilderness comes lifting up. The proving of faithfulness, the proving of trust. But it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. This day of judgment was not just about Sennacherib and his own wickedness, but it was also about Hezekiah and his faithfulness and trust. As for the wicked, he has a message for them. Verse 8. In the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Cup is tied to judgment and wrath. With foaming wine, well mixed, he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. His cup is waiting, and they're going to have to drink every drop, despite how violent it is. The response should be that of verses 9 and 10. I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked, horn is a, a representative symbol of strength. I will cut off their strength, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Hezekiah is rescued, Judah is rescued, and they are given a future and a hope. They have the promise through Christ. John would tell us in 1 John 4, verse 4, you are from God and have overcome the false teachers, those who are against Christ. For he who is in you, see God was in Jerusalem, and he was greater than those who are outside the city. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's greater than Satan. He's greater than any of Satan's forces. He's greater than any temptation. He's greater than anything that's outside in the world. What about you this morning? Are you tired of running from safe place to safe place to safe place only to find there is no truly safe place? Are you ready instead to submit and surrender to the one who will make himself, his own strength, a quote place of safety and a place of refuge for your life no matter where you're at? Would you come to his son, Jesus Christ, put him on a baptism for the forgiveness of sins this morning? Or maybe you are a Christian, you've done that, but you know you need repentance. You know you need to re respond in a public way. Please know this moment is for you. And while it does take great courage to make that decision and to respond in a public way, please know we're here for you, and the Lord is here for you as well. Please use this time, if you need to, come now as we sing.